Hey everybody, welcome back. So every time these US ARC alerts come out, they're always talking about permits for our animals and bans on certain species, and things like that. And you know, for the most part, we all try and play nice with this stuff. But today I wanna to talk about, are these things really necessary? Why are these permits being imposed? Why are these bans being imposed? What's what it's based on? And do we really need them? I think there's a lot to be said about that today on Intrepid Exotics. Whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. Now, as you guys can see, I've got Jay with me today. He's my orange glow phantom, male reticulated python. And this is one of the animals that's always on the top of the list when it comes to bands. Mostly you'll see Burmese pythons on there because those are the ones that get the most press. But retics, being the longest snake species on the planet, they always end up getting a bunch of attention as well. And are you, are you like making sure you get your camera time or what? <laughs> I love this animal. <laughs> he is so curious and so full of energy most of the time. But, <clears throat> but what, what is the purpose for these bands? What are the reasons why these, you know, fish and wildlife organizations and city councils and all that stuff find it necessary to ban and throw all these permit requirements on something as simple as a pet snake. Um, I really don't think, even with as much noise as they make about it sometimes, I, I can't think of too many legitimate reasons why we would have to have these animals permitted. <sighs> Jay, I'm gonna put you back. I can't talk with you acting a fool. For serious, for serious, man. You gotta help me out here. <clears throat> so there's a couple instances where, you know, I can see a permit may make sense. Now, if you've got an area such as the Everglades and you've got a species that really has the potential to, to legitimately be invasive, then maybe that's a good instance where you may wanna have those animals permitted so you can keep track of them. Make sure you hold the keepers to a higher standard. Um, Instances with like very dangerous animals, venomous reptiles is an example, crocodilians, things like that. Things that are really dangerous, you know, I don't see a problem with permitting stuff like that. So I thought Athena, my Burmese python here, would be a good co-host for me today. Um, especially since anytime you talk about permits and bans, Burmese pythons always come up. And, you know, there's, there's probably a part of this whole discussion where I, I probably sound kind of hypocritical at some times, but it's because I try and keep an open mind about things and I try and stay realistic. There's a lot of things that I've got really, really carved in stone beliefs about and all of those things that are carved in stone for me are based on evidence. Um, you know, I, I've looked into something, I've seen the evidence, I've seen the facts, it correlates to reality. So, you know, my beliefs are what the facts are. And, you know, it's one of those things where it takes facts to change those opinions. Um, I'm open to it. Anything that I'm a firm believer of and things like that, uh, you know, if you bring facts to the table and rational discussion about why I may be wrong or why I may need to reconsider something, I'm always right on board with it because it just put, gives me, it strengthens my relationship with reality. Um, and I do have some pretty um, carved in stone beliefs about the permitting system. And when we start talking about that in regards to reptiles. So when we talk about permitting, we've really got to consider why there should be a requirement to have an animal permitted. And that can typically lead you to two parts of the conversation. One is it's a safety issue. Two, it's an ecological issue. And I, I think those are the two big categories you can really drop any argument in. And in most cases, I think in most states, 
either one of those arguments is really bullshit when it comes to requiring permits for our animals. And I'm going to explain why. Um, when we've got an issue like the Burmese python here that are down in Florida, they have a really finite area, a finite ecosystem where they can thrive. And they have. Now, we could make an entirely different video on what the situation actually is down there, considering that a vast majority of the FWC is tied in with land developers down there. And most of the studies have been done by, you know, Florida universities. And not a whole lot of external research has really went into that. Um, you know, for the most part, Florida gets to cash in on the python hunts and things like that. And that's, that's not to say that it's not an actual concern, but I do personally think that that, that concern has been kind of blown out of proportion. Uh, and there's a lot of other ecologists, too, that, that share the same opinion. But neither here nor there. Um, a situation like that, I can see a legit reason to have the need to have a permit to keep, like, Burmese pythons and stuff down there. And the big concern with the permitting process was demonstrated when FWC went in and slaughtered all of this guy's animals. Uh, it has to do with the execution of the permits. You know, how well do those officials know their job? How well do they know the animals? Um, you know, how much good faith is the state going to execute in, in defending the lives of the animals and the rights of the keeper that are doing all the right things? Uh, you can see down there where Florida dropped the ball big time and really screwed it up. Um, and that that's something that could happen across the board. Anywhere where you start imposing a bunch of restrictions on people keeping animals, and the people that are enforcing them just don't know what the hell they're doing. You know, either that or they simply don't care. You know, it's that's worrisome when we talk about it. And that's why, you know, a lot of the watchdog groups, US ARC and US ARC Florida, um, have been working, you know, so hard with Florida trying to get that whole mess cleaned up. And of course it spreads, you know, you get additional legislation showing up in surrounding states. The Louisiana thing is the last one that's come up. But without beating a dead horse about Florida, you know, we all know what happened down there. Um, and as far as ecological concerns go, I mean, especially, you get north of the Mason-Dixon line, or the states that are close to that area right there, or we start getting up into higher latitudes, these animals aren't an ecological threat at all. Because barring them, you know, finding a hot house to live under or something like that for a winter time, um, you know, they may survive a season, and then they're going to die off. They're definitely not going to propagate and, you know, support any breeding populations. And all of this stuff, too, ties into, you know, like the video that I did not too long ago on a Titanoboa. You know, the reason why that animal got so large is because the climate was so hot at that time. Um, Cold-blooded animals like reptiles, in order to support mass, need to have a warmer climate. You know, you're not going to find any 16-foot retics running around in Michigan. So why would a state like Michigan propose any kind of ban or you know, legislation surrounding these animals. Uh, the, the ecological concern is completely out of the question at that point. So the only other thing that we would be talking about in, a, in an area like that that would be talking about putting permit requirements in is the safety issue. Um, now, I, I'm not averse to the idea of having restrictions on endangered and threatened species, things of that nature. That's, that's kind of a different discussion. That's why, you know, a lot of birds of prey and things like that are illegal to be kept. But if we're talking about an animal, a reptile, that poses no ecological threat to an area, then the only other concern that they could possibly have would be safety. Now, let me ask you this. I mean, how many of those folks, if you're watching this, and you're one of those people who think that these animals are too dangerous to be kept without a permit, and to be kept without the state jumping in and trying to regulate them. Uh, what are your thoughts on the constitutional carry of firearms? Seriously. You know, what are your thoughts on any kind of gun control? Because, you know, 
rest assured, if your actual concern is safety, then I guarantee you, even my 16 foot retakes, even 20 foot retakes, um, they are not near as dangerous as firearms. So, you know, you can pretty much rule out any person's argument who's talking safety, who doesn't have at least an equal concern about firearms. Now, I'm not stating a position one way or another. It's a debate that I don't want to get into. I've got my thoughts on it. Um, I've had them pointed at me and I've pointed them at other people. And I'll tell you what, though, without going too far into it, I've scraped up a lot of bodies of victims of firearms violence. Not one of those victims was put down by a good guy with a gun. So just let that thought sink in for a minute. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, so the safety issue, again, you know, we could talk about that. We could talk about the fact that people will say, well, you know, your snake can overpower a kid and kill it. Well, you know, your Labrador can overpower a kid and kill it and does so more frequently than snakes do. So why aren't we talking about getting permits on golden retrievers, Rottweilers, Dobes? You know, a lot of people have ruled out pit bulls and so forth. That's, an, again, another discussion for another time. But, you know, if you're pushing to have people be required to get permits for snakes, why would you not push to have people be required to get permits for dogs? Yeah. Um, cats are, are a perfect example of an animal that's unregulated, and it is an ecological disaster all over the world. Australia has, has just recently put down a bunch of new laws about feral cats because they're decimating the natural populations of everything out there. Reptiles, birds, you name it. Um, cats are, like I said, ecological nightmares. Um, you know, I can hardly go outside in the woods in my house anymore and find any kind of animal other than the feral cats that are back there. You know, because they've eaten everything. <laughs> it's, it's really friggin' terrible. But... You know, we talk about something that's actually dangerous like that, and uh, we're not pushing for permits for that. Um, I just, I can't really think of a good reason for berms, retics, monitor lizards, things like that uh, to be permitted unless there's a special case where you're in an environment where they could stand um, to cause ecological problems or uh, if, if there's something that's very very dangerous um, you know if we're talking about hot venomous snakes um, those are much more dangerous than any constrictor you're gonna get your hands on um, you know a venomous snake even if you're doing things right in a split second um, it really can be a matter of life and death you know loss of limb things like that so and, and they pose a greater threat, too, to anybody that's around that person. So I'm not terribly against the idea of folks needing to get permits and demonstrate some, um, and demonstrate that they're adept with working with these animals um, in that respect. And I think most keepers would probably agree with me to some degree on that point. You know, things like crocodilians, uh, it's another thing that's really kind of dangerous that uh, can, can go bad really quick. Not a terribly bad idea to ask folks to get permits for those. You know, they, they've got a lot larger living arrangements that you've got to provide for them, things like that. And it's more uncommon that people are going to keep gators and crocs and stuff like that. Um, so like I said, when we talk about permits, I'm not against the, the reasonable application of these things. And again, you know, once, once those are in place, what protections do we have from the state once those permitting requirements are there? Because that's the biggest fear of most of the reptile keepers. It's like, yeah, you know, the state's going to come in. They're going to ask me to permit all of my animals. And then the laws are going to change the next year, the next voting cycle. And then they're going to be like, oh, okay, well, these are banned. Your permit's no good anymore. We're going to come in, take all your animals and kill them. Yeah. And you, nobody who's a big advocate of permitting can with a, with a straight face or a clear conscience dismiss that concern. Because like I said, we all had a front row seat of it down in Florida when you know, they, 
for, for lack of a better term, simply screwed the guy and the, and, and the animals and everything with that whole situation. So reasonably, people are worried about getting the state involved in pushing permits on animals that are otherwise safe, you know? You know, just like down in Louisiana, they're talking about moving it from 12 feet to 8 feet. A 12-foot snake is not hard to handle at all. I mean, I know this is an alien concept for people that don't keep reptiles and, and aren't familiar with constrictors, but a 12-foot snake is an easy snake to handle. And even when we start talking about, you know, like the two big retakes that I've got down there, they're easy to handle outside of just the mass. You know, I don't have to fight with those animals. They're not trying to kill me. I've raised them for years and years. They know me. And, you know, those of us that keep these animals realize how safe they are. And, uh, you know, it's just the folks that don't know anything about them. Which is another big reason why we really push the educational stuff so much. Uh, you know, I want to get out there in the community and expose people to these animals and let them see just how peaceful and docile they can be. You know, and you're going to get non-snake people saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know what, there's a yeah, but for freaking everything, dude. Um, I, I've walked in on, on uh, scenes before when I was working with the medical examiner's office and these two chihuahuas had started to feed on the decedent. I mean, your dogs can be just as terrible, if not more so, than, your sna than our snakes can be. Uh, make no mistake. Uh, a bite from a dog is much more dangerous, much more injurious than it is with a constrictor. Um, you know, my daughter's still got a scar down the whole front of her lip from a dog bite she got when she was a kid. And, uh, you know, I had a 16-foot snake get a hold of my wrist and stay there for about five minutes. You can't even see anything anymore. You know, once the little hematomas went down, you took a picture of it. You could hardly even see anything, but a couple pinholes, a couple days, it was all gone. So these things aren't as dangerous as some people would make them out to be. Uh, we can make mistakes with anything. You can make mistakes with dogs. You can make mistakes with <sighs> snakes. You can make mistakes with big lizards. Um, life happens. You know, one thing that, that is really cool about the reptile community as a whole is, for the most part, it's pretty much self-regulating. And we really don't need the state's involvement. We don't need anybody coming in here trying to uh, play either the knight in shining armor or making a big, big stink for, uh, to make a shiny nickel off of somebody, uh, like politicians are also commonly known to do. Um, it's self-regulating for a couple reasons. One, the community as a whole will... Uh, pay really close attention to uh, irresponsible keepers and things like that and we address it pretty quickly um, to the point to where you know we have got to consciously make places make safe places for folks in our groups and stuff where okay there's gonna be no negativity here we're only talking about snakes and enjoying the community and because eh, there's a lot of us that, that come down pretty quickly and pretty hard when people do something wrong um, which is something that I don't really remember seeing in any other community that, that I've been a part of. Um, plus, on the other side of that too, not just do we keep track of each other, but if it's self-regulating in the respect that if you don't know anything about snakes and you go and you try and buy a 12, 14 foot snake, you're immediately going to pay a consequence for your lack of familiarity with that animal. You know, you're not going to know what to do. You're going to have a bad experience. Um, so people don't do that. People don't stay in the hobby if they don't have the, the motivation or the wherewithal to learn about the animals and learn how to handle them because they get afraid of them, you know. Uh, most large constrictor owners that I know you know, have, have raised the animals that they've got. They read them. They've got great relationships with them. Um, and you, you can really easily dismiss all the arguments that talk about how dangerous these snakes are 
with the thousands of hours at this point that the reptile community has of our animals interacting with the kids, the kids interacting with the animals, you know, our animals just hanging out with us and doing just like this girl's doing. I mean, she's a small, what, five foot, maybe Burmese python. My 16 foot reticulated python does the same thing. And I have got the same level of concern about, you know, my big snake as I do this little one. Because they're not mean animals. They are not. Especially once they know you, once they trust you, once you trust them. They're just, they're such a joy to keep and a joy to work with. And they just want to chill out and hang out. Eat every now and then. They're really one of the easiest animals to keep. So, anyway... You know, like I said, there's there's some cases where you can justify the permitting stuff, but in in more cases than not, somebody's talking about the uh, the need to permit snakes. Generally, is talking out their ass um, because most of the places in the United States, these animals won't thrive in the wild, and those of us that keep them have. We, we feel more safe with our animals than we do with, more, with most people. Um, I definitely trust my animals more than I trust mo most people. Um, and I think that's probably about the same across the board. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about this, this whole rush on permitting animals and things like that. The fix for it is public education. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I push so hard to get out and talk with the community get involved with kids, uh, scout groups and stuff like that. We just did the museum. We're definitely going back there. We've had some awesome experiences with the community out here. And, and that's another reason why I, you know, I, I make the videos and try to try to encourage people and help people to get out and do this kind of educational stuff with folks. Because what happens is you may get like a town council or something and they have a vote. We want to outlaw this animal. We want to, you know, ban people from having retics in our in our county or in our city or whatever. Well, that that person that's just the weekend before went to one of our events and watched their kid just light up when they could sit there with a 16, 18 foot snake and play with it and be perfectly safe and to see how close we are with our animals and so forth. You know, Maybe that person is going to speak up and say, wait a second, you know, have you guys ever actually seen people interact with these animals? Because they're not the vicious killers that some people may think they are. Uh, all that stuff is really important. Uh, you know, we, we reach out to the community in order to, you know, help educate folks about these, about these animals. Uh, it's really important to do because you can't go into everything adversarial. Because there's more of them than there are of us. You know, if everybody looks up and says, you know, okay, well, every reptile keeper I've ever talked to is an asshole. They just yelled at me and told me how stupid they are. I got nothing for them. I don't keep snakes. I don't care. Ban them. You know? And if they don't like it, throw them in jail when they break the law. I mean, is that really the type of relationship we want to have with community? I, I really don't think so. Yeah, you know, I want I, I want us to be able to you know really open up and help people understand the animals so that we can show that there's no need to restrict or ban them. There's no need to throw a bunch of permit requirements down on these animals um, outside of a few instances where it really kind of makes sense. Um, but overall, those restrictions are unnecessary. You know. A bad thing can happen in any environment between any living creatures, you know. Bad things happen between people all the time. And uh, we're not requiring anybody to get a permit to have a baby. Matter of fact, I think in many cases I would be more on board with requiring people to have a permit to reproduce than uh, to have a snake. I think we would be better as a society for it talking out the side of my mouth of course but some truth to it <laughs> but guys you know that's add your thoughts down in the comments and you know if you haven't already get down get subscribed to the channel of course that's pretty important too but 
Yeah, this is just a dialogue that we got to have when we're talking about, you know, the permits and the bands and all this other stuff. We all do really got to be on the same sheet of music and we've, we've got to keep it as positive as we can. But I think, I think overall, we really need to get into a position, not just in the reptile community, but in society in general. You know, we need to require evidence. We need to require rational argument and evidence before we go implementing something. Uh, before we develop opinions and beliefs about something. It's just, it, it really is that simple. Everybody gets flooded with misinformation and, you know, they get stuck in these information silos where the only thing that they hear is what they believe. And they believe, so the only thing that they look for is the same thing that agrees with them. And, and before you know it, you get some people that are so detached from reality, you know, it makes the rest of us just kind of sit back and cock our heads like a confused dog and go, man, what the... What are you thinking, you know? And it's just one of those things where we, we all need to make a concerted effort to make sure that we're, you know, at least allowing our uh, thoughts on things to conform to what's real. Not what we like, not what somebody else wants us to think, to what's real, what's really going on. And, uh, you know, that applies really heavily to reptiles because... I think if somebody's going to propose a permit or a ban on an animal, they need to have a big mountain of uh, evidence to support their claim that they need to be permitted. And from what I've seen, that evidence is not out there uh, to support bans or permit requirements on most reptiles. So we'll all think about that, and I'll go ahead and get her put back up. I don't know that she wants to, though. You said that sweet girl. You're like the sweetest snake ever. You really are. And I'll go in and start editing the crickets out of the background. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, I've raised her since she was a hatchling. And she's just the sweetest little girl. <laughs> Like I said, I trust her more than just about any person on the planet. So I'm going to put her back. You guys have an outstanding day. I'm going to put the video of the uh, U.S. Ark Alert up here so you guys can check that out. And we'll see you next time on Intrepid Exotics.